God bless you for being here today. Thank you for the presence of the Lord. You may return to your seats. Amen. While you turn into the book of Luke, if you would, please, the fourth chapter, in verse 18 and 19, and verse 21. I like what Brother Don said. Sometimes we need to change our routine. When God put Noah in the ark, three stores high, one door, one wonder in the top. And God closed the door. And when God closed the door, no man can open it. There was devastation and death all around. Water's boiling up from underneath. The water's coming down from heaven. But there's only one wonder in the ark. And that was in the top where they could look up. There's times in our lives that we need to trust God and just look up. Noah had no idea where that ark was going to land. He had no control to navigate it and where it was going to go. All he could do was just look up. Listen, God has a plan for our lives and the blessings of God. And I'm thankful for that. And sometimes that's about all we can do is look up. Luke 4 and verse 18 and 19 and verse 21. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recover the sight to the blind, and set at liberty to them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now verse 21. Jesus said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. We want to share this morning, the fullness of the abundance has come. It's already existing here with us. The fullness of the abundance has already come. In other words, Jesus could have said, Genesis 3.15 has been fulfilled before your very eyes right now. I am the Savior of the world. I am your deliverer. I am what you need. The fullness of the abundance is already come. Jesus rose from the dead, and 40 days he appeared to disciples, 500 brothers, Signs, miracles, and wonders for 40 days. He appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to Thomas. He appeared to men on the road to Emmaus. And their hearts burned within them. And then he tells them in Luke 24 and 49, I want you to remember that word 40. He said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father unto you, but tear you in the city of Jerusalem until you be endured with power from on high. And Acts 1 and 8 says you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now you notice the word tarry. It means to set down. To set down. It also means to dwell Continuously setting down, tarry. They did that for 10 days, sitting down. Every number, every word in the Bible has specific meaning. 120 people means the end of all flesh. And why sitting down for 10 days? 50 days. The fulfillment of Pentecost, meaning the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The reason they had to sit down, the flesh worketh no good in the kingdom of God. 
Whenever the flesh gets involved trying to do things in the kingdom of God, God quits working. Because the flesh cannot understand the things of God. Then he says here, they to sit down. I want you to notice this throughout as we share with you this morning. Nowhere else in the Bible from that day on you ever find where they tarried. And neither did they seek God. Fulfilling the book of Joel, I know that's a little controversy from what we've been taught and hearing. But I believe that God has something for us when we learn that he's pouring out his spirit. Joel has been fulfilled when he pours out his spirit. And it says here in Acts 2 and 1 through 4, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Verse 2, Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were, what? Sitting. Old Testament is by works. The New Testament is by faith and the Spirit of God, what he brings to us. Verse 3 says, There appeared unto them clothed in tongues, like as fire, and it set upon each of them. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. That brought the end of the flesh and started the miraculous working Spirit of God. I'm a living example. If you want to look at a living example, I never heard about the Holy Ghost where there was a Holy Ghost. I didn't know nothing about that when I went to church. The only reason I went to start with to hold Peggy's hand. I had no other intentions of being there. But during the revival, I felt the need to repent, and I went to the altar. I wasn't seeking the Holy Ghost. Didn't know there was a Holy Ghost. Didn't know any of those kind of things. But as I repented my sin, as Brother Michael, I didn't know one scripture. I couldn't quote you one scripture in the Bible. I don't never remember ever reading in the Bible. But I tell you, God is faithful. He outpoured his spirit on my life. And I have never been the same since then. I want to share with you through this today, you can receive the Holy Ghost where you're sitting. Amen. You don't have to be at no altar. You, that's all right if you want to, but you can receive it where you're sitting. Sister Hick got the Holy Ghost baking bread one morning, just fell on her because it's been poured out. Joel is not the only one that prophesied it was going to be poured out. Habakkuk prophesied, Jeremiah prophesied, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let it be done. All you got to do is believe in your heart and it will fall on you because it's present help in the time of need. And it fell on them. I understand Brother Fritz DeLuce got the Holy Ghost driving across the bridge in Louisiana. Just fell on him. I mean, believe that God wants to fall on you today and help you. He's a very present help in the time of need. The Bible said faith was present to heal. He's present here to do what you need in your life. He'll fall on you just like that. And as they spake the tongues, Luke 4, 21, he said, This day the Scripture is fulfilled in your ears. When the Scripture is fulfilled, we ought to rejoice. We ought to rejoice. The book of Joel said, I'll give you back for all the years of canker worm and wood worm aid. I want you to start expecting what you've lost is already present with you and all you have to do is receive it. Praise God. He cannot lie. He's no respected person. He's not the only one that prophesied that. Joel prophesied it, that God would restore back to you. Amen? You don't have to wait any longer. I'm here to tell you this morning, my wife is homesick in the bed, but I'm going to sow some seed. Amen? I don't know how it's going to grow. 
Let me shift gears a little bit. Let him. You can get a miracle in your wilderness. You can get a miracle in your famine. God told Isaac, said, sow a seed in your famine. I want you to start speaking to things that don't look right, that can't get right by the human eye, and it can't get right by the human flesh. But when you sow the seed and the Word of God and believe God, it's going it's to grow. You don't know how it's going to grow. You don't know when it's going to come up. But you know, Sister Ron was telling me something the other day. She said, I know this is going to come to pass in my life. How many know this morning it'll come to pass in your life? You don't know how the seed's going to grow, but it's going to grow because you have a promise from the living God it's going to come out just like God said it was. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. You can't teach an old dog what? Come on, help me out. You can't teach an old dog what? New trick. I watched a dog show the other day. And the man that asked him about that, he was a dog trainer, he said, ain't nothing to that. I can take the oldest dog that's still alive as long as he's got life in him. I can train him. If God can allow a man to train a dog, how much more can God, his own present, take what is left over and turn it into something miraculous? Amen? I knew a man, he'd gone on to heaven now. He would not eat leftovers. His wife had to cook him three meals a day. I don't know about that. We eat a lot of leftovers. How many know a stew gets better after the second or third day? Amen? It gets better. Amen? It, 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 just, just try it and see. God wants to give you something fresh this morning. Amen? I don't care what it feels like, what it looks like. God wants to give you something fresh. He's fresh here this morning. The freshness of God. Hallelujah. Acts 4.21 said, I mean Luke 4.21 said, This day the scripture is fulfilled in your ears. That's what Jesus said. Acts 4.33 said, With great power he gave the apostles witness of the resurrection and of the Lord Jesus Christ, and great grace was up on them all. How many believe you have the favor of God? You have the favor of God. Grace means favor. The great favor of God is upon us. We wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the grace of God. What's the old song? There goes I if it had not been for the grace of God. Thank God for the grace of God and the favor of God. Acts 5, 16. It says this. Peter shatter. Healed them all. Peter Shatter healed them all. We all could be healed this morning just like that. Your spirit could be healed just like that this morning. Your body can be healed just like that. It had nothing to do with the shadow of Peter. It was the presence of the living God and the promise of God that came out of Peter and transfer it into them, and heal them all. Heal them all. Hallelujah. Acts 6 and 8, and said, Stephen, full of faith, full of power, and great wonders and miracles, or did those among the people. He wasn't one of the twelve. Now, the reason I'm going to share with you this, there's a teaching going on and has been going on since I've been in the church. It was done away with the twelve apostles. I want you to know healing and divine feeling of God and the baptism of the Holy Ghost has not been done away with. How many can witness to that? It has not been done away with. Amen. We heard some testimonies in the Sunday school class this morning. It's here. Praise God. There has to be a mind. I read the other day, the main thing we have to learn how to do is to change our mind. We don't change our mind. A wise mind changes and blinds many times, but a fool never does. Got to be a mind change. Got to have the mind of Christ. Let the mind of Christ control us. Acts 8 and 6. Philip, he was not one of the twelve. He went down to Samaria. He preached Christ. Everybody ought to said preach Christ. Listen, when you speak the word of Christ, something is going to happen when you believe it. 
when you act upon it. It can't help but happen because God has already given that promise. He preached Christ there. Unclean spirits come out. Some that was paralyzed was healed. The lame got up and walked, and they were all healed. All of them. That, I tell you, that's something. Wouldn't it be something that God moving this city so bad on this 100-mile race and everybody just get healed? You say, that's impossible. If God could carry 3 million people out of Egypt and carry them through the wilderness for 40 years and sent his word in Psalms 107 and kept them all healed, how much more so that the blood of Jesus and the stripe of Jesus is more powerful. Even Solomon in all of his glory and all of his power cannot be compared with the power and the glory of Jesus Christ. He had no power except he got it from Jesus Christ. He's alive and he's among us. I don't care where you go, he's with you. He's working for you. Amen. Praise God. Then we have in verse 17, that same chapter, Peter and John came down from Jerusalem. And what did they do? They laid the hands on all of them. And what happened? No tearing, no waiting, no seeking, because it's already been poured out in Acts 2. The power of the Holy Ghost was poured out. Now all you have to do is receive it. Amen? How many enjoyed that song, The Blood of Jesus? I'll tell you, if anybody ought to get to their feet and shout it, it ought to be the Christians. I'm, I'm serious about it. We ought to stand to our feet when we start singing about the blood of Jesus. He's forgave you of your sins. He's washed your sins away. He put them in the sea of forgetfulness, and he don't never remember them against you again. And the book of John says, and the cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. That word cleansing meaning he's cleansed. Come on, church. It's time for us to realize if you sin, quit doing penance, do repentance because the blood of Jesus cleansed you of all your sins and he has set you free. You are free indeed. Amen? There's something inside of us. It's the blood of Jesus that's keeping us clean and pure. We do make mistakes. We don't need to mourn over them and just grill over them because the blood of Jesus is making us white as snow. Oh, he needs to have credit and glory for what he's done. And what he is doing, what he is doing today. Amen. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to Peter. I mean, Philip said, I want you to go down to the desert. So he just hooks up and heads off to the desert, leaving a mighty revival. I heard a evangelist saying one time, I wouldn't have left. I would have stayed there at that mighty revival. That's the difference in him and Philip obeying the Spirit of God. We do not bring a revival. God brings a revival through us. Without the presence of God, there is no revival. Some says you've got to have an have evangelist to come and have a revival. That's not in that book. That's not in that book. Paul told Timothy, said, you do the work of of evangelism. The church is to do the work of evangelism. When they come into the church and the body of believers, there should be anointing of God that changes their lives. Philip just jumps up and runs off down there. Then he stands there. He didn't know where to go. How many times? Glory to God. I'm going to slow down. Sometimes God will lead you somewhere. It's contrary to the flesh. And everybody will think, well, they sure miss God. Listen, Hallelujah. They, they probably thought Philip missed God going off down there in that desert, nobody around. And them chariots are running by. He didn't know what to do. He just waiting to see when God tells him what to do. And God says, join that chariot. He jumped up on that chariot and witnessed to that man from Isaiah. And then he asked, the Ethiopian said, I want you to watch this. It says, what hinders me? I want to ask this question. I've been asking my question. What hinders me? What's hindering my family? from receiving what God has for them, what is hindering in our path, what do I need to do? And the Ethiopian says, what has hindered me? And Philip said, nothing has hindered you if you believe in your heart. And he said, I believe. And they stopped that wagon of chariot and got off and both went down into the water and was baptized and Ethiopian came out of the water rejoicing and going on his way full of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the Lord picked up Philip and carried him 30 miles away. How many believe that can happen today? 
I'm telling you, God is alive. He's wonderful. Cornelius, he was not a Jew. He was a just man. Paid much to alms and tithes. Done a lot for the people. He prayed always to the one God. And an angel, the Lord, appeared unto him. He said, go down to this city called Joppa. And you'll find a man called Peter. Oh, hallelujah. The Lord had to let that sheep down three times. How many know that God has to convince us sometime? Amen? How many is hard to convince? When I first got in the church, started reading the Bible, and I'd read it, and Peggy would read it with me, and I said, well, I don't see that. She said, I don't know why you can't see it. It's just as plain as you can see there. But I said, I don't care. I don't see it. How many of you got to get it for revelation from God? And once you get a revelation from God, things will change. And he's told, the Lord told Peter, now there's three men waiting on you down at the gate. Now watch this. I want you to go. Peter's still not convinced. He's not convinced. I want you to go with them doing what? Doubting nothing. He girded up himself and said, let's go, boys. I've heard from God to go with you. He went in there, and then you have to read chapter 11 to go along with this. And the Peter said, as when the Jews questioned him for him being down there with them people like that, them Gentile, and Peter said, Who am I to withstand the Lord? Said, As I spoke, and they were sitting, just like you are. How many know you can get a miracle right where you're sitting? You don't need to be on the front bench. Some of you's on the back bench. That the anointing's back there. If the anointing's not back there, is it like it is down here, then we're in trouble. With the anointing of God fills this place. And the Bible said, as they sat there, amen, no flesh involved. They just sat there, had their mind on Christ, had their mind on the preaching of the Word of God. And Peter said, as I spoke, the Holy Ghost fell on them like it did on us. Now, you go back and read Acts 2. How did they receive the Holy Ghost? With fire, rushing mighty wind. It fell on them just like that. They didn't seek. They did just, they, God just pouring out. Come on, church. God is pouring out what you need today. Amen. What you need, you let's let him know. Asking you shall receive. It's already been done when we ask God. Sometimes we pray for people and we wonder why they don't get healed. I mean, Jesus did the same thing. He prayed for multitude and they didn't get healed just in your Bible. God wants you blessed beyond measure. He wants you to have the full abundance that he has for your life in the blessings of God. And Peter said, who am I? Who am I to withstand God when they received it just like we did? Then we find uh, another perfect example, the Philippian jailer. He's going to kill himself when God knocks the doors off the hinges. Paul said, we're still here. Took him outside, and washed old Paul's blood and Silas's blood off of him. He baptized all of the Philippian jailer's household, and they all received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. How come? Because it was already fulfilled in Acts 2, the outpouring of the Spirit of God. Outpouring the Spirit of God. Brother Powell and I was in the Alexander, Louisiana, a couple of years ago, because of the time, the Pentecostal of Alexander, and a guy was there from the evangelistic field. His name was Billy Cole. I don't know where any of you all ever know or heard of him. Brother Donnie, Sister Donna, you ever heard of him? Billy Cole, great big guy. He got up there and said a few words. He just come back from overseas, an evangelist. He said, I was one night, I was a preaching, and a group of Muslims was crowded all around. As I preached, the Holy Ghost fell on 500 at one time, and they all spoke in tongues at one time as the Holy Ghost fell on them. He said they were just standing there, and the Holy Ghost fell on them. Why? It was already poured out in the book of Acts, the second chapter. It was poured out on them right there. He said, then we made an announcement. All wants to be baptized in Jesus' name tomorrow. We're going to have a baptism service down at the pond or the river, wherever it was. He said, all of you wants to be baptized, y'all come. 
He said, we could not believe how many Muslims showed up and uh, how we baptized. I want you to know the Holy Ghost is still alive. He's not dead. He's still pouring out his blessings. He's just pouring it out. Hallelujah. When he sees a heart that's hungry for God, he just pours it out on them. The Bible is full of it. This world is full of it. I read this story just this week. I don't know how old the story was, but I read it just this week. This lady of the household spent most of her life in a chair with crippling arthritis. And she was contemplating having her knees replaced because the pain was so bad, the arthritis in the knees. Her husband was watching a TV program calling Believer's Authority. He was so impressed. He said, Honey, come in here and watch this with me. She went in there. And they sat and watched it. And when it's over with, he said, Honey, stand up. In her crippled condition, she stood up. I want you to tell me what happened when she stood up straight. Somebody shout out what happened. She was healed immediately. She had her nightgown on. She run around and around the house. She run out the front door, ran down the street just in her nightgown and just the shouting and the praising God. You said, oh, I don't know about that. That's what the man at the gate in chapter 3, when the presence of God came upon him, he jumped up and ran in the running, jumping and the shouting. I mean, you know, if God was to heal you, you've been in a wheelchair for so long, God, I, I believe you'd run across those pews. Amen. You say, Brother Billy, they couldn't run across. Listen, nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with those that believe God. When we believe God and act upon the promises of God, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. She run back home, run in the house, and there laid her husband on the floor, and she said, oh, my God, he died. He died. But she found out the Holy Ghost had fell on him, and he would fell out in the power of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. How many know Jesus Christ is alive today? He's going to be alive tomorrow. He's going to work miracles as long as he's here in the presence of God. We have a promise from God that can't go away and cannot fade away. Praise God. You ought to shout hallelujah that God is your God. He's a present help in the time of need. Well, I don't know about you, but I need him every day of my life. Benny Hinn said, if I miss one day, like a prayer and like I should, and reading the Word, I feel like I'm losing the presence of God. How I many you know we need the presence of God? We need Him. It's one thing to need Him, and it's one thing to hunger for Him. To hunger for Him. We find in Acts 19, where Paul came up on son of John the Baptist's convert he said have you received the holy ghost since you believed they said we have not even heard it was the holy ghost verse 5 said he baptized them all in the name of the lord jesus christ and verse 6 said paul laid his hands on them and what happened with no tearing no waiting because the promise has already been fulfilled and poured out every day of our life we're living in a wonderful blessed life of the blessings of god and what God is doing in our lives. Romans 8.33 said, How shall he, God, not with Jesus, also freely give us all things? I don't know about you. I'm not a very educated person. I know that. But I believe all things means all things. I, I, I just believe that. It, it means all things. With God, that means with God and the Son. You find this in St. John 17 also. He's praying with us that we would be one with Him. That we would be one with Him and with Him and the Father. That we can have all things. All things. All things is ours. Because He's already spent it and done it for us. Jesus speaks of God. I mean the Scripture speaks of God and Jesus in that Scripture, that same Scripture. To bring about 
the great promises that he's promised. He's bringing it about. They watched Jesus and said, we've never seen it on this fashion before. We've never seen it like this before. And what he's doing. And when Jesus quoted this scripture, it made an imprint on my spirit. Jason Crump and Angie invited us to go to the, the theater to watch the, the film, what is the Passion? And I was so impressed as he was carrying the cross. And I know this is in the Bible. Blood was all over him. And Mary broke ranks and ran out to him as he fell beneath the cross. And what did he say? Anybody remember what he said? Can you imagine under the heavy burden of a cross and all the blood pouring off of him? He said, Behold. I'll do new things. How could he say that in a situation with him? Because he believed in the resurrection. He'd already told him, you destroy this body and I'll raise it up again in three days. I will come out of that grave. And then he went back to heaven and he's doing new things. He's been doing new things for 2,000 years. He's going to keep on doing new things until the end of this world. Go ahead, God bless you. Before they come, if they, I don't know where they want to come back and sing. We done had prayer. But Isaac, let me go back to him, was in a famine. Devastation was in the land. If you search these scriptures out, you'll find that many, many miracles were done in the miracle in the wilderness when there was hopeless situations. Everything was hopeless. Nothing looked like could happen. And God speaks to him and says, I want you to sow. I want you to sow. Now, the seed means the Word of God. I want you to speak the Word of God here in this wilderness. And the Bible said he received a hundredfold the first year. Bible scholars said that's impossible. You cannot receive a hundredfold the first year sowing. I don't care what they say. I believe what God said. He received a hundredfold. When everybody else was devastating, everybody else was destructive, everybody envied him. The Bible said he become wealthy. Then the next verse said he come very wealthy because he obeyed God. Moses spent 40 years on the backside of the desert. But one day, something happened. Sister Linda, one day, something happened. Oh, glory to God. One day, he looked and he saw a burning bush. He'd seen a lot of them in them 40 years catch on fire and burn. And it was a burning. He investigated it. And the voice from the bush, the Bible said was an angel in Acts, I mean, Exodus 3. Deuteronomy said the bush was God. I want you to watch this now. The bush was God. And the angel in the bush was Jesus Christ with a flame of fire. And as he approached it, oh God, the voice said, take your shoes off. Church, we got to get rid of some fleshly things if we're going to see the miraculous things of God. Get your shoes off because they're relating to the dirt. The voice of the angel was Christ Jesus, a flame of fire. Did not John the Baptist say he will baptize you with what? Holy Ghost and what? And fire. I must decrease. The flesh, I said I was going to quit, but I'm going to repent. We must die daily to our flesh. There's one thing that hinders the miraculous working power of God is our flesh. That's why it's got to be killed, destroyed daily. I was talking to someone the other day about this that's having some trouble. 
They said, well, I always thought that scriptures meant to die with the game, with to go to heaven. I said, that, you can think that way if you want to, but that's not what that means. To die is the gain. When we die to ourselves, die to our flesh, Paul said, I buff my flesh. I keep it under subjection where the presence of God can work in my life. The flesh is a hindrance to the power and the working of God in our lives. That's why he has to be crucified daily. You cannot just crucify him one time. Mm -mm. There's a lady got in the church many years ago. Had a wonderful experience with God. She testified one night. This is what she said. I feel the old man scratching out of the grave. What did she mean? That old self-life was coming back alive. And eventually, she left, and we never did see her no more because she didn't kill that flesh. The desires of the flesh can kill the anointing. It has to be crucified daily, kept under subjection, kept under control by the power of the Spirit. God is working mightily to bring us to a new life and give us a life. I tell you, it's devastating what's happening in this world. But I want to encourage you, be like Noah. Get in the ark, let God close the door, and all you do is look up and let God Back in the war, the time in Suez Canal, Lebanon, they sent us down there for evacuation. We had to go through the Suez Canal. And the only way you can go through that canal, you have to get a pilot to come aboard the ship. He takes control of the ship. The captain is no longer control of the ship. Brother Arnie, he, he, the captain is no longer control of the ship no more. The pilot is to take it through that dangerous, treacherous canal. We ran aground and pulled off our sonar gear. I won't go through the rest of it, but I'm telling you, the only one can guide your life perfectly is Christ Jesus. Anybody else try to guide your life, it's going to run aground. And the first thing you know, the sonar gear was our protected equipment from the enemy. It pulled it off. God wants us to trust him. I don't care what it is in Noah had no place. He, he didn't have no idea where he was going. He didn't know where he was going to land. He had no control over anything. But he landed on the mountain. Oh, glory to God. I guess I got to quit, had not I? When we trust God, we're going to land on the mountain. Oh, church, we're going to land on the mountain. Oh, my goodness, what God is going to have for us when he lands us on that mountain. But if we try to pilot ourselves, first thing you know, we run aground and we lose our valuable strength against the enemy.